is because at least that's consistent throughout the whole motion. The linearity is not. In other words, as I flex, my arm goes forward to start, but if I keep flexing, then, <laughs> then it goes back. And yeah, there was some upward the whole time, but first part's going forward, then the next part going back. So the, the linearity of it changes, but the angularity does not change. And I don't know why I got super excited about angularity. It just gets me excited. So protraction and retraction. Uh, come on, buddy. Right? So left scapular protraction, right scapular retraction, but you can have bilateral pro, bilateral re. Um, again, the key thing here is helping our functional circle. Anybody happen this weekend to kind of try to separate those motions just to kind of feel what's scapular and what's a glenohumeral? Okay. Elevation depression, left scapular depression, right scapular elevation. Um, again, yeah, the motion and the scapula, you got a lot of muscles yanking on the scapula, and ultimately it's the scapula that we're really looking at in terms of orbiting the ribs, so that's why we call it scapula motion. Uh, uh, so right scapula elevation and left scapula depression, but I can have bilateral elevation, bilateral depression. Remember, this is not shoulder elevation, shoulder depression. You will have a question on that. And if you get it wrong, don't come to me and tell me that it's tricky. Now, what's really cool is that we were talking about it earlier before class, that elevation really works with the glib. They all work with the glenohumeral pump. Rarely are you going to, I mean, unless I guess you just kind of like, but rarely is the scapula not going to work with the glenohumeral point, which ultimately works with your hands. Elevation is really just a limited range of motion of complete upward rotation. Because I mean, at, at the end of the day, even when I elevate, guess what? I'm taking my scapula and I'm <laughs> doing this with it. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't totally translate it up. I'd be dislocating <laughs> a sternoclavicular joint if it just came up. So when I have elevation, Typically that happens when my shoulder simultaneously adducts because I want to keep my arm uh, parallel uh, to gravity or perpendicular to the ground. So in other words, you're, you're doing shrugs. If your glenohumeral joint stayed in the same position as you'd elevate, your arms would go out. Does that make sense? You're not going to hold weight out like this. You're, you're gonna, you know, if you're holding a bucket or trying to work around the Lord, you want this to plump up so that your flexors, extensors, abductors aren't doing extra work. You're trying to be efficient here. So what happens is, is that as the scapula goes up like this, the compensation is your glenohumeral joint does this <laughs> to stay. Right? Well, what if the glenohumeral joint wanted to work with the scapula? Not in the opposite direction to cancel out, but work in the same direction to summate motion to increase your functional circle at the top. Well, that's when you get extra elevation. That's what we call upward rotation. So when, you, when the glenohumeral joint works with the way the scapula rotates, then you get up there, right? And I have another picture that I found that kind of helps to explain the lean of the scapula. Let's see if I can get a little bit, right? So again, that kind of shows you, once again, how the scapula can reposition itself, right? To help get the hand over. Anybody stay up to watch the baseball game? Yeah. Good times. I was about to go to sleep. My wife's like, you want to see what happens? She's like, I'll stay up with you. About five minutes later, she's like, oh. I'm like, well, let's see what happens. They want baby. All right. Any questions? So again, the concept of simultaneous versus summative motion. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sum it up real simple, real simple. If um, remember, joints don't translate. If you have a joint that translates, that's a, that's a bad day, right? Joints have elements of rotation and translation of, of, of the center of mass, but you don't want to translate the, <laughs> the articulating surface of it. That, that's how dislocations happen. They can, but that's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to rotate. And, um, but here, here's a quick, easy example of how translation is an illusion. So if a boxer or a, or a thrower is throwing a punch, 
and you see the hand translating, that's not a joint. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a representation of our body, but the only way the hand can translate forward is if I have one joint that wants to take it forward into my right, working at the same time as another joint that wants to take it forward into the left, and they can summate the translational properties but cancel out the rotational properties. So in other words, at the same time I'm doing this, I do that, and when they do it together, it looks like this. But if that happened in sequence, in other words, one after the other, it looked like this. So it's very similar with the scapula on the shoulder. Now it's not as obvious as that. It's not as obvious, but when you reach forward, everybody put your hand down, okay? When you reach forward, you have simultaneous motion. The scapula wants to take you across, so at the same time, your glenohumeral joint takes you across the other way and they cancel out each other's rotation and summate each other's It's pretty cool. Now, of course, if, if I'm trying to reach across as much as I can, you know, they can, they can summate in the same direction of motion depending on what I need. Like if I'm trying to reach back as far as I can, right, the shoulder motion and scapular motion would work together in the same direction. But a lot of times it's about canceling out so that you can maintain your hands in a certain position or cancel out to reach forward. Any questions about scapular motion before I get to the stuff that you got one of? Yes, sir? It's not so much a question as, as it is something that I noticed. Okay. Yeah. Whatever your arm does to like show the motion is what your your arm is actually doing. So if you elevate it, your arms come together and it yeah. adjusts and it elevates. But if you raise your arm, so like you would actually raise your arm, mm -hmm. it's the same motion and you just it upward rotates. Yeah. And just just remember though that that that's that's a good that's a good thing. It works and it's. It might help other people understand too. We just have to remember that we don't have more motion, right? I'm being picky and semantical, but we just have to make sure we remember we have scapular perspectives of motion, we have shoulder or glenohumeral joint perspectives of motion. Ah, that's a good thing for visual learners, right? You can kind of look at how how it would help, right? How it would how it would cancel out or how it's something. That's good. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Anybody else have any questions, clarifications? Okay. All right, guys, let's get to the stuff in the middle. Stuck in the middle, baby. Yeah, and I'm stuck in the middle. Oh, that's cervical muscles. Okay, so in your text, it's gonna be, I broke motion down into two, um, I'll say two types, but we have appendicular motion, Verbiage. It's really more about verbiage. Things you have to uh, we had to we had to talk about the side you want to talk about, the joint you want to talk about, then the position of the most of that. Well verbiage is a little different when you only have to talk about one of something. Now it's not the right and the left, literally my right, my left. Now it's right and left means the side of the same thing. You know, my right elbow is a different thing than my left elbow. And, but since I have two elbows, I have to talk about, well, oh, it's a good right and the left. When I'm talking about my neck, I only got one neck. So the right side of the one thing versus the left side of the one thing. Does that make sense? I know that's like, well, duh, but it's going to come into play and why our verbiage is a little different. And I always like to explain uh, the whys and not just throw it out to you. So it's a So verbiage is going to be a little different. Um, so, thinking of our cervical vertebra, first of all, all of our vertebra, right? Why do we have it? Just like everything else, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I like to look at the vertebral column as a skyscraper that's built on bedrock, right? Tall buildings need a solid foundation to build upon, right? 
So we have some fused bedrock here, and we have some pretty stable, slightly movable, but not too much where we get into trouble. Uh, these, uh, 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 but basically this is the lower extremities version of the scapula, but we don't have near the independent motion, right? We kind of fuse it in and fix it in and make it a nice solid bedrock. And then we build our skyscraper upon it. Now what's brilliant about skyscrapers in general, and this is common sense, right? The lower floors are going to be denser than the top floors, you know? Because the lower you go, the more they have to support. The, the first floor of a tall building is going to be structurally denser to support more weight than the top floor of the top building. Yeah? So it's the same thing. That, that bottom disc that you see has to support all the mass on top of it, whereas the top one at the neck only has to support the mass of the neck. Okay? So there's a natural trade-off of stability and mobility. Stability and mobility isn't just to discuss joints. Hips more stable, hips less mobile. Shoulders more mobile, shoulder less stable. Right? Trade off. Same thing up here. Because I have the, I say luxury, but because I only have to support a less, only so much about a way, I'm gonna be able to move more up here. And then as I work my way down, I'm gonna sacrifice gradually movement for stability until I get way down here, and then ultimately, I won't move at all. I mean, it's a gradual, it's a continuum, okay? The way I like to look, now, again, these are irregular bones. These are very, very specialized bones that have to serve a lot of purposes. They have to allow a little bit of motion, not too much, but a little bit. You know how much it is to just do a little bit? Uh, I guess it's not hard, but but when you have to be optimal, you know, okay, I want you to do it, but but, but not too much, not too little. It has to be just right here. Yeah. So, and because they, they can't move too much, because in between the articulations, right, are these natural little tunnels, natural little grooves at your veins and your arteries, and that's a big responsibility, right? I want you to move a little bit, but not too much, because uh, we get good, get better. No pressure. So when we look at vertebral motion, we can zoom in and look at how one vertebra moves about another. If we zoom in and look at one movement about another, that's not very significant. That's amphiarthrotic, if you remember the different classifications. It's not gonna get you much. That's like one day's worth of popping your change in the change bucket. It's not gonna get you much. But when we look at it holistically, when we don't just zoom in between one, when we look at all of them together and we do a little bit, plus a little bit, plus a little bit, plus a little bit, you know, if I look at a whole year's worth of change, well, then I could maybe go buy something of significance. So we will look at vertebral motion as the sum total of all the little bits. And with the sum total of all the little bits, you get significant contribution to motion. But we have to look at it as the sum total. Okay? Now, we are going to break down the vertebral column into two sections. The first is going to be the cervical. Basically, cervical vertebra uh, are what starts at your head, right? You got atlas holding it up and then it rotates about axis and all that good stuff. And you keep going down until all of a sudden, whoa, we start connecting to some ribs. And when you start to hit ribs, that's when you call the vertebra something different. That's when you start calling it thoracic. And then you keep working yourself down, you're like, hey, rib, 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 whoa, no more ribs. That's when you start calling it lumbar. So <laughs> just that's, that's how different one, I mean, it's a continuation of the same concept. It's just, you get to literally ribs, and then we call it something different. It's a landmark that distinguishes the ones that have ribs from the ones uh, above and below that don't. Right? Now, cervical, when you move your head or neck, I know for a fact that you're not getting any contribution from your rib vertebrae. In other words, I can just move my, my neck and everything above that first rib 
uh, has the potential, if you have normally functioning vertebra, uh, to contribute. Specifically, the contributions of these cervical vertebra aren't to reposition your arms. You, you, you haven't gotten there yet, right? The, the, the scapula is floating about ribs. So that's all going to be vertebra that connect with ribs. This is all about your functional circle of sight. It's somewhere in your workbook, but if you can't quite find it, just write it down. Functional circle of sight vision. Why is that important? Well, for the majority of people, that's how we process data. That's how we get information. Um, here's an example. Has anybody, or, or you could just imagine this, right? If uh, you're with friends, and they say, okay, uh, close your eyes for a second. That's sometimes very hard to do, depending on who your friends are. Whatever, dude. Because you want <laughs> you want to see what's coming. You want to process that data. Uh, you know, drinking impairs your processing of data. My point is, is that for a majority of people, being able to process data is how we take in stuff to eventually decide how we're going to deal with that stuff. And for us, the way we are used to processing data is with level eyes. Um, an example of this is try to be functional if you're leaning over to the side, right? All of a sudden, it's like you're, you're tipping the balance bubble and whoa, equilibrium. It's hard to process data in a way that you're not used to. So my point is, is that for us, keeping level eyes is of great importance. On the, on the field, on the court, in the workplace, in the yard, meaning that your body has a system of hydraulics and a system of shock absorbers that something in the environment may want to take your body and do this to it, but we find a way to keep our eyes level so that we can keep processing data. We have ways to stay level. In addition to staying level, st keeping your head level is going to mostly be sagittal and frontal. Transverse is mostly trying to keep your eyes on the something because it's not like moving in the transverse is going to tilt my eye all the way. But if I need to look behind me, this can only get me so far. Working with other body parts and joints to reposition my eyes so that I can see what the heck is behind me or keep my eyes fixed on something while I need to turn my body and get the heck out of there. Right? I'm looking at something, I'm looking at something, I need to keep my eyes on here. <laughs> I can turn and move, but yet still keep my eyes on what I'm trying to get to. You know, football, sports, same thing, right? You want to turn and run, but yet you may want to keep your eyes on something. You better have mechanisms in place to allow you to do that. Okay? So functional circle of sight can be a summative concept, or it can be a cancelization concept. Either way, it is of importance for us to make sure our eyes are where we need them to be or where we want them to be. And so the biggest, come on, buddy. Can we go? <coughs> so for the purposes of this class, I'm gonna really emphasize how the cervical vertebra um, can bend and move and sway and spin with the with the purpose of keeping our eyes where we want to keep it or getting our eyes where we need to get it. okay so i like to look at the cervical vertebra there's different ways to look at it i like to look at it as a slinky i think we've all played with slinkies when we were kids and the concept is similar it's not perfect but it's similar where i have a slinky and let me give it a little, a little depth, give it a little air, so you can see all the spaces in between, similar. And I can take that slinky and I can bend it in our three dimensions. I can go sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Right. Can I do that with a slinky? So I can also do that with my cervical vertebra. I can take my cervical vertebra and I can bend it sagittally, frontally, transversely. 
Right? Sagittal bending, right? That's gonna get me into a ball. Uh, get into a ball, I probably wanna put my chin in my chest. So we're gonna call that cervical flexion. Cervical extension. Now again, keep in mind, this lecture is an introduction, well, I guess it's not just an introduction, it's more developed too. But we could go deeper in the rabbit hole if we wanted to. What I mean by that is I could take my slinky and flex one part and extend the other part. <laughs> like if you, like remember the, uh, uh, not at the Roxbury, what is the, uh, yeah. there's some freaky stuff you can do with your slinky, right? For this class though, just like with the subtalar transverse partial joints, we're just talking about, hey, what if they all did the same thing so that way we can kind of all move as much as we can in those different dimensions. So, cervical flexion is going to be the bending of my vertebra to get me in more pain. Cervical extension out of here. What does hyper extension mean? You went further back than what your normal range of motion allows. Excessive extension. You could also have excessive flexion. Excessive flexion. It's just, just meant you, you went a little further or you went further than what your normal range of motion allows. Cervical flexion, cervical extension. Anybody remember that old old movie, uh, The Karate Kid, which came out when I was like 15? So, what did Miyagi teach Daniel when he went to bow? Yeah, look up, yeah. But he did like this. Look, I always look. So the next time Daniel bowed, he did this. Now again, someone who is not trained in human motion may say, "Well, your neck didn't do anything." because they're looking at these global references and saying, well, the neck didn't do anything, I'm still seeing forward. And then someone like me tries to say, no, your neck had to do something, because if you didn't, you had cervical extension. Or if you didn't catch that, start, finish, freeze my neck. Flexion got me back to where I started. But look how subtle that is, man. So, so a lot of times our cervical bending and sway is going to go with other parts of the body that if I didn't sway or bend, it would take my eyes off of being level and start to process stuff when you're not level. When you're not level, not. Okay. Or you could bend it the other way, right? I like to call this the damn. Same concept. There's nothing up there I need to process. Right. Cervical flexion. If I brought everything back to anatomical position, it'd be easier. Okay. It's really hard to not keep your eyes level. Like if you. If you were jumping, what's the name of that uh, punt jump place? Uh, Scott, is it Sky Zone? Anybody work there? Okay. Um, if you jump into the ball pit, all right, and you know you're not gonna hurt yourself, but if you jump into the ball pit, it's super hard to not want to bend the other way <laughs> as you go again to keep your eyes level. It's just what you're used to. You Gymnasts have to train themselves to not instinctively do some of these things. Um, I'll give you another example about training you not to. Um, uh, stunt men and stunt women have to train themselves when they go to fall to not reach out to stop themselves. Because they don't get hurt. They have to train themselves to not do that instinct and roll and go over the fall. Train yourself to not do uh, what your instincts want you to do. Something. All right, sagittal plane. Cervical flexion, cervical extension. It looks like it's moving and it is. It looks like it's not moving and it's not. That's my favorite. It looks like it's moving, but it's not. You see how if someone's like, oh, well if I if I look down, then it's flexion. I could be in a in a in a halo or a neck brace and still look down if I move my hips. Does that make sense? And then the last one, it looks like it's not moving, but it is. Okay. 
Let's go frontal plane. Bending. They used to, I say they used to, some people may still call it this, that's fine. I'm just trying to explain to you why, you know, it kind of evolved, but they used to call this lateral flexion, but then they were like, well, if flexion is really reserved to fetal and not a fetal, then that doesn't seem very fair, right? You know, like, watch out! You know, you're not gonna really kind of fall up laterally. So, so a, a, a new term that's kind of coming in, kind of, I, I dig it because it kind of reminds me of what the slinky dude is, is a lateral bending, right? Bending, swaying. Anybody ever been at the, at the top of a tall skyscraper, you know, overhead? Guys, that thing sways. It's kind of freaky. And it sways. This is a big force, but, but, it, but it sways. And so we sway. We can kind of sway when we need to sway. Now, why do we laterally sway? Well, for a couple of reasons. But the biggest reason is so that when our body wants to tilt to the right, we can go <laughs> back to the left to keep our eyes level really comes down to functionally the biggest reason is to maintain eye level so that we can process information. Right? You're here, you're doing something like this, you want to keep your eyes level. It's kind of hard to kind of process stuff like that. We want to be able to bend so that even though our body is pouring water out of one side, we can bend back the other way if we need to. Okay. So, what do we call it? Well, remember, right and left means something different when we have one or something. It literally means to the right and to the left, left not the right the left. To the right, to the left. Any of you have gymnastics backgrounds at all or work with kids in gymnastics? Cool. If you ask a child to do a cartwheel to their right, I think a majority of them would, <laughs> well, this is my right, to my right, to my left. To my loo, my daughter. So, bending the cervical vertebra to the right, or bending the cervical vertebra to the left, we're going to call that right and left lateral cervical bending. We have right lateral cervical bending, right ear gets close to the right shoulder. And left ear show, uh, left lateral cervical bending, left ear gets close to the left shoulder. Now, it doesn't matter, the ear doesn't have to move. Remember, I could do it the other way. In this case, the right shoulder got closer to the right ear. <laughs> it's, it's about the, the ultimate local change in those ankles. Right and left lateral cervical bending. Why do we insert lateral to insinuate the plane of bend? Because in the transverse plane, if you're working with a, a young gymnast and you say, hey, hey, Sally, spin to your right. As fast as you can, spin to the right. They may do something like this. Spin to your left. So right and left mean, it means something in two dimensions. Right and left doesn't mean anything sexually, right? Hey, Sally, do a front roll. To the right, you know? <laughs> in other words, when you're in the sagittal plane, kind of right and left kind of cancel. But in the frontal plane, to the right, to the left, and in the transverse plane, to the right, and to the left. So frontal plane bending with our slinky is right lateral, left left. Right lateral, left left, tip top. Cervical flexion, extension, right lateral, left left. Now, let's, re let's remind ourselves about position. East, west, traveling east, traveling west. This is right lateral cervical bending from anatomical. This is left lateral cervical bending to anatomical. And if I keep going, then it's left lateral cervical bending from anatomical. So in other words, an entire range of motion, if I start on one side and go to the other, is right lateral, 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 right lateral. Left lateral to, left lateral front. Right lateral to, right lateral front. Right. Transverse plane, right and left, mean something different in a different dimension. Look to your right, look to your left. Spin to your right, spin to your left. Right. Now you got a lot of motion 
a lot more motion up here. You know why? Because I don't have to worry about holding up all that stuff up here, especially my up here. So you get a little bit of extra motion with that with that specialized pivot joint, that atlas axis. It's a specialized trochoid pivot joint, but you also get some small contributions of the other vertebra rotating. So you can start. It's a heck of a lot more than what your trunk can do, which again is of importance. If there's danger, I sure as heck want to get my head around to see what's coming or what, what, or what I'm dealing with. Okay. Taking in, processing data is of great importance. Okay. Cervical flexion, cervical extension, right lateral cervical bending, left lateral cervical bending, right transverse. So we had right lateral when we're talking about frontal plane contribution. Right transverse, cervical rotation. There's that R word that we don't see all the time, but we see sometimes. When do we see that R word pop up in motion? When it's more, it's a P word, and it's not Patterson. Um, Colombian cocaine might be 100% Whoa! Somebody knows their Colombian cocaine. <laughs> pure, right? Pure rotation. Meaning that there is rotation with flexion and extension. There is rotation with right and left lap. But you know what else there is? When I flex, my, the center of mass of my head goes forward and down, up and back, down and to the right. right? There's, there's a lot of, there's some translation as well. But when we get into the polar axis, looking to the left and to the right, it's more pure rotation. So that we say that. Uh, the knee, same thing, right? Look, apple, banana, strawberry, sledgehammer. This is a heck of a lot different than that. We'll go to our shoulder. Apple, banana, straw, strawberry, sledgehammer. You know, it's, it, when, it's, when it's about the longitudinal axis or the polar axis, um, if it becomes more pure, we add that rotation. So right transverse cervical rotation, kind of looking to your right. Left transverse looking to the left. Now, remember, it doesn't have to literally be from anatomical. It could be too anatomical. So in other words, this is just as much left transverse as this is. It's just this is to, and then this is from. To and from. Cool? Now, here's where it'll get tricky. It'll get tricky with those illusional examples. Like if I'm trying to keep my eyes in the back of the room and I rotate my whole body to the right, what does my cervical vertebra do to keep my eyes fixed on what I want? It actually rotates to the, I'm looking at my left shoulder. I wasn't looking at my left shoulder. Now I'm looking at my left shoulder. I wasn't looking at my left shoulder. Now I'm looking at my left shoulder. Yeah, I had to spin my vertebra to the left. And once again, I get it, man. It comes down to this. Lefty Lucy, righty tighty, lefty Lucy, righty tighty. Yeah, that's if I'm looking down on it. But righty, righty Lucy, burn. So, so we 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 initiate conceptual motion. You know, we we have to pick, and typically we pick the smaller thing moving about the bigger thing. We pick the smaller thing moving about the bigger thing. We pick the smaller thing moving about the bigger thing. We pick the smaller thing moving about the bigger thing. We pick the smaller thing moving about the bigger thing. But the bigger thing can move about the smaller thing. But it's gonna look different. It's gonna look different. Okay. So in other words, if you only hold on to if I see something spinning to the right, it's going to be right. Not necessarily. Keep, keep, keep looking at it as change in position. Keep looking at it as change. Where was I and where am I now? How did I have to move to get there? Keep doing it like that. Don't hold on to these global references. What I mean by that is if I had, may I? 
let's pretend this was a, uh, a board game, right? Not a B-O-A-R-D, not B-O-R-E-D. I guess so some of them can be bored. And let's say we're playing uh, a and that. If I move my person here, right, maybe they're traveling east. But you know what else can make them travel east if I keep them still and then move the board? <laughs> Good. You see what I'm getting to? What we, we, we introduce you to these motions by moving the smaller thing about the bigger thing. But technically, we could have the same change by moving the bigger thing about the smaller thing, just not in the same direction. It's in the opposite direction. Opposite global direction. Same local direction. So what I'm trying to get you to see is that right and left transverse, yeah, life is great when we're moving the smaller thing about the bigger thing. But it can be a little tricky when we move the bigger thing about the smaller thing. But if you don't look at it as, well, how is that not transverse? You moved, you spun to the right. Where did I start? Where did I finish? And if I have to spin to my right to go back home, guess what? I had to rotate to the left to leave home. That's what joint motions are about. Joint motions have never been about global references. They've been about local references. So I think that's going to be our biggest challenge.